Hi, I'm Pastor Kevin Baird of Legacy Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm so glad you tuned in today to Legacy Media. This ministry is supported by the faithful tithes and offerings of all of our members that attend this local church. They are glad to be a part of this outreach. But you might want to be a part of our extended family and help us as we enlarge and reach more people. So if you feel so led, maybe you'd like to send a gift to us, large or small. We're a church, nonprofit organization. And you can send that gift to Legacy Church, 1401 Sam Rittenberg Boulevard, Charleston, South Carolina, 29407. We also invite you to check out our website at www.legacychurchsc.org. We hope you stay with us. Enjoy the message you're about ready to hear. Again, I'm so glad you tuned in. God bless. I have the incredible honor to do what I don't often get to do because when I'm at home, usually I'm the one standing here uh, delivering to you Sunday morning message. But it's Mother's Day, and uh, I just thought it would be appropriate to hear from a successful mom. And uh, I, I'm a little biased, as you might think, in this area. So I, I fully admit my biases in this area. But uh, my wife is going to come and, and share this morning. You know, when she was like 12 years old, I think, she was at a, a camp meeting or church meeting of some sort, and God called her. Now, in the circles we were in, that calling uh, was interpreted to mean that she would be a pastor's wife one day. And indeed, she became a pastor's wife. In fact, we have together been married over 31 years, and we've pastored for now... 29 years together. We'll be coming around uh, to 30 years here in the not too distant future of pastoring together. She has been with me in every location, every crazy story I tell. She's been there. And let me just tell you something. The, the life of a pastor's wife is not always easy because what people would never say to me, they'll, they'll chicken out, they'll come say to her because she's friendly and they love her and uh, she's easy to talk to and that's her personality. Don't do that to her. Let me just say that. Don't do that. Come, 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 come talk to me, all right? If, uh, amen. But anyway, but what we've come to find out through the years is, is that not only was she called to be my helpmate, she's got a call in her life to minister the gospel. And she goes uh, to conferences. Some of you ladies know this. Some of you don't. She goes to conferences and she'll speak. Sometimes we're called together to go places and we both speak. And when it's all said and done, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, Pastor Baird, you, that was really good. But we love your wife. We want her to come back. We want her to speak again. All right. And that's why she doesn't speak much around here because I'd lose the congregation if I let her talk too much. No. But I tell you what, I am proud of my wife. I am proud any good thing that has gone on by way of our family and our household, I can tell you right now, without hesitation, I attribute it to her. And uh, we have kids that we love, and, and, and they serve God, and she's done a wonderful job at all of these things. So I could go on and on and on, but let it be said that uh, she's the mom of the house. We call her mama in the house. And so what we do at Legacy, when there's a guest besides me, we honor them, don't we, when they come to Legacy. So would you stand to your feet and put your hands together as mom comes to talk to us this morning. Pastor T. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't tell him to say that, but I did tell him not to talk too long because I only have so much time. So don't be taking up my time with my intro. Okay. So um, I'm really excited to get to speak to you today. Uh, you know, last week, Pastor started a new series entitled Roots, Appreciating Our Christian Heritage. And uh, last week, he talked about how that some of us have really great Christian heritages. Some of us maybe grew up in Christian homes, but our foundation was a little wobbly. And then some of us in this room have no Christian heritage as far as our natural family tree grows. But the good news is this, that if you're here today, or if you're here listening on iTunes or watching me, that's just very scary to think that people are watching me. So anyway, 
because my hair did not want to do well today. But can I say, the Lord kind of came through there at the end. But um, anyway, so um, if you're watching me and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want him to be the Lord and ruler of your life, then you have a Christian heritage. Pastor's gonna be talking more about it in the weeks to come. I'm really excited about next week's message. It's Pentecost Sunday. But um, so today I wanna just kind of follow that same theme. And we're gonna talk about mothers of the Bible. Okay, because uh, mothers of the Bible are important. And you know, I started thinking about this this week. That if, you know, God can do anything he wants. And God could have just plopped down the prophets, the preachers, the deliverers that we know of in the Bible. He could have just plopped them down on this earth. Because think about it. He took Enoch and Elijah out of this earth without them having to die. So is it not possible that he could have brought some great men and women of God into this earth without them having to be born of a woman? He could have. But you know what? Even God knew the importance of a mother in the, in the mighty servant of God's life. And so today, I want us to look at just a few of them. Now let me tell you, these women were not perfect. Thank the Lord. Okay, because all of us in this room who are mothers, is there anyone perfect in this room? Raise your hand. How about that? None of us. None of us have been perfect yet. We're not asking our children for testimonies, Deborah. So don't turn around and look at your mother. Okay. Um, but, but none of us are perfect. And so that gives us hope that, you know what? We don't have to be perfect to be used of God to raise up mighty men and women of God. Okay? So today we're going to look. The first mother is Eve. Eve was the mother, as we know, of Cain and Abel. Her story is in Genesis 3 through 5. Now, I'm not going to take the, the time to read all these stories. You're gonna, you can look them up on your own if you're not familiar with them. But Eve was the first woman on the entire earth, which in turn made her the first mother in the entire world. Can you imagine? She didn't have anybody to ask any advice of. I mean, I can't even imagine. And the, and the sad thing is about Eve, she was the mother of the first murderer and the first murder victim. Can you imagine what her pain must have been? Can you imagine the condemnation of the enemy? Because as we know the story of Eve, she was the one that took the apple, convinced her husband to eat of it. And I'm sure that that same enemy who came to her that day, he was reminding her the day that her son killed her other son, what a loser she was. And Eve, you were just like the world's most terrible mother. Because look, your children have committed murder. You, you're a sinner. Is there any hope for you? But you know this about Eve? Years later, she had another son. Do you remember that? Do you remember what his name is? Seth. And Seth means, for God has appointed another seed for me. Let me read what the commentary says. It says, this seed given to replace the murdered Abel was the first in the bloodline that was traced to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though Eve played a significant role in the fall of mankind into sin, her body became the actual soil in which God's mercy plants the first seed of promise. The message of her life is obvious. God is able to make all grace abound toward us, any of us. However deep your failure, Eve's testimony declares God's grace is deeper still. So today, if you were here and you have a sinful past, all of us have a sinful past, don't we? Some of you may be some things that the enemy likes to keep throwing up in your mind. Well, I want you to trust it and, and believe that if God can use Eve, that he can use you. And who knows that God might be wanting to do miraculous things through one of your children. Our second mother today we're looking at is Sarah. Sarah was the, mo was the mother of Isaac. Now, her story is a long one. It's in Genesis 11 through 25. Now, we're all pretty familiar with this story. Sarah was the wife of Abraham. And remember, God came to Abraham, even though Sarah was barren. God came to Abraham and he said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now, can you imagine how excited Sarah was? Because if Abraham was going to become the father of many nations, that meant she was going to be the mother of many nations. And can you imagine this? If you think I'm going to be excited when I get to find out that I am going to be a Grammy, and yes, I may be a little obnoxious. 
But, uh, hold up, my earpiece is coming off. Okay, Sarah was even more excited than that. She was about 72 years old at the time she got this word. She was probably at Babies R Us with that little gun thing, that little thing that you register stuff. She's probably going around that whole store registering things. And she wasn't even pregnant yet. She was so excited. But you know what happened? It didn't exactly happen. Exactly nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. She did not get pregnant. She did not get pregnant for years. And then, just like Eve, and so many of us in this room, we began to listen to the condemning voices of the enemy and maybe some people around us. You know, people were probably saying to her, see, Sarah, it's your fault. You're the problem. You're the one that's holding up this show. There must be sin in your life. So, she did something that I cannot even imagine. I can't even imagine anyone in this room imagining it. She willingly gave her husband to her maidservant, Hagar, so that they could be intimate, so that he could receive his promise. Now, one commentary said that after the birth of Ishmael, which was the son of Abraham and Hagar, that the Lord appeared to Abraham again to make it clear to him, buddy, you messed up. <laughs> that's supposed to be Sarah. Sarah is the one that I'm going to bring forth the promise from. And it said that Sarah laughed. She didn't laugh out of surprise, and she didn't laugh out of astonishment. It said that she laughed out of unbelief. How many of us moms in this room, however, missed our destinies or at least postponed them for a long time because of unbelief? Do you think that her belief was regarding God's power? I don't think so. I think her unbelief was thinking about what a failure she was. Thinking that she was unworthy to have a promise come from her. You know, she had obviously messed up in her first advice about the whole Hagar situation. And perhaps now she was just completely overwhelmed with self-doubt and unbelief. Have you ever been there, Mom? Have you ever just messed up as a mother and a wife to the point that the enemy convinces you that you can't be used of God? I've been there many times. But I want to tell you today that God has a destiny for you, ladies. Moms, he has a destiny for you. You must believe it. Don't forfeit your calling or your destiny just because of the lies and the opinions of other people. That everybody's going to have an opinion. Miss Brenda and I were talking about it this morning. Everybody has got an opinion about what a mother should be. Now, let me just tell you about a story of mine. You know me, me I'm going to tell a lot of stories today, so you like this part. Because remember, Pastor, they always remember the stories. Okay. Back in 1994, some of you have heard this story before. I was, we were on staff at Evangel Cathedral, and I was at a women's conference, and I was in the back working at the table, and ministry was going on up here, and I wasn't even paying attention because I was back there doing my job that I was supposed to be doing, and um, prophetess Kathy Leshner was there, and she was ministering to women. At, there were hundreds of women lined up here at the altar, and she stopped in the middle of her prophetic word, and she said, you, right back there in the red shirt, come up here. And they were like, Tracy, Tracy, it's you, it's you. So I went up there. To be honest, I didn't even really know what she was doing because I had been doing my job and not really paying attention. And she prof over, prophesied over me, you will have a baby girl. And it shall not be as it was before. Now let me tell you, when I got home that weekend, there were plenty of opinions flying around. And there were plenty of judgments flying around about what God was saying and what wasn't God saying. And maybe it was the flesh and maybe she had eaten too much pizza the night before or, or whatever it was. But that, there were many, many opinions about what, what, whether that word was God or not. And so Pastor and I prayed about it and I got pregnant. And 14 weeks into that pregnancy, I lost that baby. Now, you talk about some opinions and some judgments flying. There were really a lot of words being said then. How we had missed God. How we had tried to make things happen. How that wasn't God in the first place. People watching us. 
judging as to whether we would stand for God's word. You know, some people want you to stand. Some people don't want you to stand. Some people, if you do stand, they're sitting back going, let's see, let's see. I mean, you know, people just always have a judgment. But Pastor and I stood on that word, and once again, you know that story, that, that even that baby was said to be dead at nine weeks. But that time we said, and you, you talk about some more judgments and words coming. At that point, we said, no way, Jose. We are going to believe God. We had the hel elders lay hands on me. We, he prayed and fasted for three days. And I want to tell you that that product was this little girl right down here who was singing on that praise team this morning, Kaylin Rama Baird. Rama meaning that which the Lord said. And I'm just telling you, some of you women need to listen to what the Lord says and not worry about what man says or what your mama says or what your daddy says or your co-workers say or your neighbors say because you are living for the audience of one. Now, we talk it big, but when trials come, we as moms are the first ones to start doubting ourselves because the enemy convinces us that we're a big screw-up. And I want to tell you, do not lay down your destinies this morning. Do not believe the lies of the enemy. Galatians 1.10 in the New International Version says, Am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Do you want to be a servant of Christ, ladies? All right. Then you don't worry about the opinions of people. Is that hard? Oh my goodness. Yes, it is. But we've got to do it. Sometimes I think we're susceptible to the judgments and opinions of other people because we've made so many of them ourselves that we've spewed out there. When it comes to motherhood, is it not true that people have an opinion about it, especially men? And y'all ain't never been a mother. So y'all just need to hush, okay? Okay? Um, I love you, and we couldn't be mothers without you. <laughs> but, um, you know, people have an opinion of whether or not a, mo a woman should work and have a career. They have an opinion about stay-at-home moms. They have an opinion about whether you get pregnant when you're 20 years old. I got pregnant when I was 22. No, no, 21. I would have gotten pregnant at 20. But we were in seminary. I mean, that's all I wanted to do was get, be a mommy. That was the minute I got married, buddy, I was ready. I wanted to be a mommy. But we had to get this man through seminary first, okay? But um, people have an opinion about young mothers. And they really have an opinion about older mothers. If you get, if you get pregnant, Laura, if, they, if you get pregnant in your late 30s, 40s, Miss Louise was telling me yesterday at the abortion clinic, she was 43 when she got pregnant with Valisa, and her doctor said, you need to abort this baby. No. No, you don't. People have an opinion about everything. And listen, we make grand judgments. Ladies, we do it as well. Now listen, this is to you. I'm speaking to you. We make grand judgments about what we think a mother should be. And why do we do that? Because we want to be feel better about ourselves so we can look at somebody else and we can make you look less than that makes me feel better. And we do it to each other. So we need to stop this. We make a, a, a judgments about how, what her age should be, what she should look like, what her career should be, how, how well she keeps care of herself, what her home looks like, and especially about the behavior of her children. We make all these judgments. And then life happens to us. And not in our timing, but in God's timing. And then all those judgments that we have spewed out there for years and years boomerang back and come slap us right in the face. You know, all my life, just like I said, I wanted to grow up, I wanted to marry a preacher, and I wanted to be a mommy. Now, even in that what seems like simplistic desire, I still had very preconceived ideas of what motherhood would be like. I made all these judgments. When I was a teenager, I remember I did a lot of babysitting. I worked in children's church, so I was around kids a lot. And I remember being at restaurants like many of you have been. Restaurants and in the middle of stores, and you see these kids acting like little hellions as they're running around. And you say, well, bless God, my child will never act like that. I'm telling you, if you just whip that child, they'd straighten up. They wouldn't act like that if you'd just wear them out a couple times. And then the Lord heard me. 
And then he blessed me with Clayton Daniel Beard. A spirited, I wrote this down, I feel like this was the Lord giving me these descriptions. A spirited, strong-willed, opinionated, smart as a whip, a cleric, CEO qualified, little boy who pushed every button I had and then made some new ones. I remember when I was a day, well, this one day I was about 30, about 34 years old. By that time I'd already had all my three children. And I had one of those rough days as a mother. Anybody ever had one this week? Raise your hand. Where you're just like, mm, mm, I'm just, mm, you want to hurt somebody. And uh, I remember, I, I, <laughs> like the Lord took me back and I saw myself, I was yelling at them. I was so mad. I was screaming about how they had embarrassed me in public and I was not going to stand for it another day. And just that quick, the Lord said to me, it's not that they acted so terrible or that they acted worse than any other children their age. The problem is, you're upset because you were personally embarrassed. You're making this all about you. You see, my kids were acting badly, making me look bad before a whole watching world that I had made it clear to that my children would never act like that. See, moms, we better be careful what we say. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What does that mean? That means that the Lord's going to allow you to eat your words to get you to be humble. Every child is different. And as pastor says to us, we need an anointing for all things, and we definitely need an anointing to parent. Have you ever thought for just a second that maybe God purposely allows your children to not fit the mold or the schedule of the baby wise book? Because he knows that if they did, you would think you were the genius, and then you'd go around telling everybody else what you do, they are doing wrong and you're doing right. Because how many of us know, when we get successful at some things, we want to rub it in somebody else's nose. Maybe God is not allowing your child to fit into the mold because God has purposely ordained that child to never fit into this mold of this society and to be a nation-shaking power man or woman in this society to break this mold. You know what? Clayton Daniel has never fit anybody's mold. But today, he's at a church of 8,000 standing before a congregation preaching. I'm telling you, you couldn't, you couldn't ever get him to fit anybody's mold. But God had his hand on him just the same. Do not lose hope. I, you know, I, some of these parents in this church are so awesome. I, I told Chris and Melissa the other day, I, I'm just so proud of them. You know what? Sometimes you've got to take them out. Clayton got taken out of church four and five times a service and wore his tail out. And we would bring him right back in. He'd lift his little hands and praise the Lord. He'd make it about five minutes. He'd be kicking somebody. We'd have to take him out. But, and you know, and some days they're having to do that to Malachi. But you know what? Malachi is going to be an awesome man of God. You know what? You don't give up. You don't give up, but you don't curse the, the, the giftings that are in your child. And maybe they're just not going to fit anybody else's mold, but God has a plan for them just as well. I'm going to tell you another story I was sharing with someone this week. You know, whether you're 20 years old here this morning or you're 70 years old, as moms, we need to admit our mistakes and our failures. The Lord can't help us to be better mothers or wise grandmothers unless we humble ourselves and admit that we didn't do everything right. You know, we all have our critics. Sometimes as mothers, our children are our critics. Sometimes our parents are our critics. Sometimes our neighbors are our critics. Sometimes somebody in the middle of the grocery store is your critic. You just want to turn around and look at them and go, just walk away before I lay hands on you. Um, you know, everybody thinks they would know exactly what to do. And you're just trying to get through the grocery store. I remember Clayton would be running around the grocery store and then he'd 
throw Tyler over in the cart and oh it was just it was a sight it was sometimes and I just you know I would cry in the middle of Bilo and I just think oh God I can't do this but you know God was with me and he helped me to raise those boys and he will help you but we all have critics but the thing is I'm 50 years old now and I was telling one of our moms here this week 95% of what they say about you may be a lie but if 5% of it is true, we need to own up to that 5%. And we need to repent of it. And we need to say, Lord, that was me. I did mess up on that. Because you see, when you agree with your adversary, he loses his power. See, when the devil's coming to you and say, you blew it as a mom with Clayton. Let me tell you, I blew it bunches of times with Clayton. But you see, now, and I was thinking about this this morning on Mother's Day, um, he and Bethany sent me flowers yesterday. I'm thinking, you know, I just love him so intensely. But the thing is, I have gone to him hundreds upon hundreds of times. And I've said, Clayton, baby, I missed it with you. I am so sorry for the times I didn't do it right. But you think if you do that to your children, they will disrespect you. Oh, no. That's a lie of the enemy. They love you all the more if you say, I'm so sorry. Even right now, Pastor and I, if we have days in our house, which amazingly enough, every day in our house is not just like the blessing of the Lord flowing down. Can you imagine? Okay, I mean, some days it's intense, just like at your house. Some days we have a fight. Sometimes we yell at our children. Sometimes it's not good. But the thing is, I believe it's true in these, at least these last 15 years. When it happens, we will say, everybody, everybody come down. Everybody come down from upstairs. And we say, you know what? We messed up. We blew it. When mom said that to dad, that was ugly. I disrespected him. It started a fight. And I need to own up to that right now. And I'm just telling you, Kaylin, don't ever do that to your husband. Or he'll say, Tyler, don't ever do. Don't, what I just did, don't do that. That was wrong. You see, that causes your children to respect you more. When you own up, to your problems and to your mistakes, then God can use you. That was what makes you wiser. Not denial that you ever made a mistake makes you wiser. Owning up to it makes you wiser. So I look back now at 50 years old and I see all of my mistakes, but I tell you what it also causes me to do. It causes me to have such mercy and appreciation for my parents. You know, my parents are now 80 years old and I know they're watching me. Hey, Daddy, Mama. And they did the best they knew how to do. Some of us have some wounds and we have some hurts because our parents didn't do it right. They didn't do it perfectly. But you know what? They did the best they knew. My parents didn't have James Dobson and they didn't have DVDs to watch on how to raise godly children. We do. But even us, even we, unfortunately, sometimes will spend more money and more effort and more time watching DVDs and shows about how to invest our money, about how to play golf, about how to fish, about how to decorate our house, and never spend one minute studying the Word or reading a book about how to raise godly children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I guess we think it's just going to come naturally to us. Can I just say, it doesn't. It does not come naturally because you naturally are a fallen creature. You naturally will do exactly the what you saw when you grew up. And maybe, maybe you grew up in an awesome house where everything was right. I didn't grow up in an awesome house where everything was right. My parents even know that. But here's the deal. When I was growing up, when, when, when we were growing up and we had Clayton, he was a strong-willed child. Y'all, I'm talking so strong-willed that every James Dobson book did not give me the enough knowledge or wisdom as to how to raise this child. And my parents, I would go to them and I'd say, what do we do? Because he would always act like, always, always. You ever notice this? Always when you go to grandma and grandpa's house, they're going to act up. They are going to act their worst, and your mom and dad are going to look at you and go, what you going to do with that? You, you, you going to let them act like that? And so my parents... Do, gave me the advice that they only knew, and that was you beat them. Okay, my parents were raised in South Carolina in the 1940s. The answer to everything was you beat them. And we did that. We were faithful to beat him. Sometimes, four and five times a day, he got beat. 
sometimes four times during one church service. He got, he, he got taken out. His little rear end wipe wore out. But you know what? That was the best we knew. Was it working too well? Mm, not really. But we were, we were faith, being faithful. And then one day, God sent us Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall was Clayton's third grade teacher at Westgate Baptist School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Mrs. Hall was about 60 years old. And she was a Baptist preacher's wife and the mother of five boys. And so I went in, Kevin had something he had to do at the church that day. And so I got to go to the parent-teacher meeting alone, scared to death. I was about 29 years old, young mom, going into this parent-teacher meeting with Mrs. Hall. Now granted, you have to understand, Clayton had been spanked in kindergarten at school for writing on the wall. He had been, never had a recess the entire second grade year because he had to stand at the fence every day. I was like, can I just say, and I think every teacher in this room would agree, don't put a kid against the fence if they've been acting up with ADD. You need to let them run the fence, do something, you know. At Northwood, when Kayla was at Northwood and they'd get in trouble, they'd have to walk the fence. But at least they got to do something. To put every, this woman had some issues, honestly. Her husband had left her. She was a second grade teacher. Her husband had left her. She, had, she didn't like men. So at, at recess, every boy in the class was lined up against the fence. <laughs> Only the girls got to play on anything. Every boy's lined up against the fence. Um, so anyway, so I, here I am going into the third grade parent-teacher conference thinking, oh, dear God, here we go. And uh, Mrs. Hall looked at me and she said, I just want to tell you that your son is such a blessing. And I literally said this, no ma'am, I'm Clayton Baird's mother. <laughs> she said, I know who you are. And then I started crying. And she said, I'd like to repeat myself. Your son is such a blessing. I said, what do you mean? No one has ever said that about him. So we began to talk. Then she said to me, what's the last thing you say to him when you put him out of the car in the morning to come into school? I said, I promise you, I look at him and I say, Clayton Daniel, if you get in trouble today, when you get home, I'm gonna wear you out. <laughs> I said, I promise, I say it every day. And she said, that's what I thought. She said, you know what I say to him when he walks in the door? I said, no ma'am. She said, I say to him, Clayton, I can't wait to see what great things you're going to do today. She said, honey, you need to learn right now that children will live up to the expectation you put on them. You expect him to be bad, and he lives up to it. I expect him to be good. And he lives up to that. That day changed our lives. Some of you teachers need to understand you have the power to change a child's life and to change a mother's life. Now, I started doing better, but I'm telling you, Mrs. Mrs. Hall gets all the credit for Clayton because that day, that year, she spoke every day. Seven and eight hours a day, she spoke life to my child. And honestly, that day, that year, he changed. He never gave us a moment's trouble after that. Never. Because she spoke life to him. Death and life are in the power of our tongue, parents. Please, if you don't hear anything else from this message today, Speak life over your child. Even in the days that they are acting up the worst, you look at them, the little boys, some of them, I, I look at these moms, I see their faces. I have them in children's church on Wednesday night. I know what it's like, okay? And you look at them and you say, listen here, you little rascal. God loves you and I love you and you're gonna be an awesome man of God. So right now you need to listen to me and you need to sit your little self down in this chair and you need to do the best you can do on that picture because you're making it for God. 
And you know what? Some of those most challenging children in this children's church, when we talk to them like that and we say, I want to see how great you can do, I'm telling you, they get on task and they live up to that expectation. And then they come to me afterwards and they say, Pastor T, I was good, wasn't I? And I'm like, you were good. They want to be good. They want to be good. Speak life. I'm having a problem with my mic. Hold on. All right, next mother, Rebecca. Woo, woo, woo. Rebecca is the, can I just, okay. That's not gonna work, hold on. Rebecca is the mother of Jacob and Esau. She, her story's found in Genesis 25 through 27. Am I still okay? No? All right, keep, I'm gonna keep talking, don't worry about me. Okay, as the boys grew, let's look at this scripture, Genesis 25, 27. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter he was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Is it okay? All right. Now, here's two big mistakes that I see in this one verse. We could talk about Jacob and Esau all day long, but we don't have time. Here's the deal. Two big mistakes these parents made. Number one, they each had a favorite. Parents, there is nothing more damaging to a child's self-esteem than for you to make it clear to them that they are not your favorite. Now, each one of my children is different, okay? Each one of my children, they all have different temperaments and different personalities. And is it true that if we have a whole bunch of kids, that sometimes we will mesh better with one than the other because our personalities just work together better? Yes, that's true. But it is so important that we do not say out loud, this is the good one, and this is the bad one. Even in us telling our stories on Clayton, Clayton knows that's true of him. He thinks it's the most hilarious thing he's ever heard. Because you know what? He sees now that, you know what? God can use him. So believe me, we love him. We love Tyler. We love Kaylin. You've got to make it clear that you love them all. They're all different. But that one's not their favorite. Second thing I noticed here. Esau was loved for what he brought to the table. Literally. Literally brought to the table. It says Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game that he brought home. He was not loved just because he was a gift of God to that family. He was loved because of what he could do for his father. I have always wondered about Esau. When you hear the story of Esau and how he so easily gave up his birthright, I've always thought, what in the world is he doing? Back in that culture, that was the most important thing that anybody could have was that birthright. But yet he gave it up for a cup, a, a, a bowl of porridge? How ridiculous is that? And then when I read that this week, I felt like the Lord showed me this. He gave it up because he was probably so tired of performing for that love that he's like, fine, here, Jacob, you take it for a while. You perform for daddy. This is my question. Are some of us in this room demanding that our children perform for us? For our, for our love? Are we demanding that they do it like we want it done? Or we're going to withhold our love? If they don't make straight A's on their report card, are they unworthy? If they don't want to go to college... Are they a disgrace to our family, to our reputation? Proverbs 22, 6 says this in the Amplified Bible. Train up a child in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I looked what, up that, what that meant in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible commentary because I thought, I want to know what that verse really, really means. And here we go. Train up has the idea of a parent graciously, graciously investing in a child whatever wisdom, love, nurture, and discipline is needed for him to become fully committed to God. It presupposes the emotional and spiritual maturity of a parent to do so. And the way he should go is to do with the training according to the unique personality, gifts, and aspirations of that child. It also means to train the child to avoid whatever natural tendencies he might have that would prevent total commitment to God. For example, 
a weak will, a lack of discipline, a susceptibility to depression. Hence, the promise is that proper development ensures the child will stay committed to God. Now, I'm going to just give you real quickly some examples of what this looked like in our house. I'm not saying we do everything perfectly, but I feel like we have had some level of success with our children, and it's only by the grace of God, and I do think it's one of those things is because I learned very early. I was very interested in psychology and all those type things, and I learned even back before, I think before we even had Clayton, the study of the temperaments, and we can't go into all of that, but you know, there's four different temperaments. Clayton Daniel is a choleric CEO going to run the show from the minute he came out of the womb kind of kid okay but the thing is he is gifted in that he sees the hill and he's like we're taking it he's not afraid of anything he would go around the world and he did Tyler is a phlegmatic temperament he is laid back life is a good place for him he wants to keep peace at all cost Kaylin is a melancholy she is artistic she is super organized but she's sensitive all of these things have to be thought through as you're looking at your children so this is how it looked in our house when we're training up our children in the way they should go clayton went to christian christian school all my children have gone to christian um, school now we can get into that i won't talk about all that some of you you're gonna have to pray about that was it an investment yes did we always have the money? No. Was it still important? Yes. That was not a negotiable for us. Maybe for your house, it's different. I'm not telling you what God's saying to you. I'm saying you better find out what God's saying to you. Okay? So for us, so Clayton graduated James Allen Christian School. His first year, he went to Anderson College in the upstate. He was studying um, church music. Now, can I just say, right from the get-go, that was not God. We missed God on that freshman year because we had just walked through one of the most tumultuous times of our ministry, of our lives. We were just trying to hold it together. Okay? That was in 2003. We were just trying to hold it together. He went to Anderson, but can I just tell you, even in your mistakes as a parent, God knows your heart. And God will see to it that he causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to a purpose. And God got a hold of Clayton Daniel Baird at a Baptist college studying church music, which church music at a Baptist college is not this music. Okay? It is hymns. What in the heck we were thinking sending a Pentecostal charismatic kid to a Baptist college singing hymns? I don't know. But, you know, we made a bad decision. Okay? So, but anyway, God met him there through this tattooed pierced boy in the dorm listening to a United Hillsong DVD and watching it and Clayton came home for spring break long story short he said to mom and daddy I gotta talk to you I know what God's called me to do we're thinking totally cool awesome sit down yeah tell us he's like I gotta go to Hillsong in Australia I'm thinking do what <laughs> I'm thinking, we don't know where our next paycheck's coming from. What are you talking about? You're going to Hillsong in, in Australia. It's a long story as to how for just a split second, his daddy and all, I almost made another mistake by thinking with our mind instead of thinking with the Spirit of God. I was just about ready to turn around in my know-it-all mama tone and say, you can just forget that. And I turned around to see my son weeping on the couch. Just weeping. I mean weeping. And if y'all who know Clayton, he is not known to be a weeper. He was weeping and saying, I've got to go. I've got to go. I'll do anything. Please just let me go. His daddy and I went in the other room and we're like, what are we going to do? We, we have no money. What are we going to do? And his father said, words of wisdom, he said, we're going to make an investment. That's what we're going to do. We may be in turmoil right now in our lives, but he deserves a shot for the best. We're not going to keep him in our world of dysfunction right now. We're going to throw him out there and let him swim. And we did. 
Now let me tell you the word, that commentary also says you got to train them up and you got to know their weaknesses. Now Clayton's weakness is that he can convince you of anything. <laughs> which some people see as a strength, but actually it's not. <laughs> not when you're the parent. Clayton needed to go away from home. Clayton needed to go to another country to grow up. He needed to go someplace where mommy and daddy could not save him from the consequences of his actions. Where God could mold him and shape him and make him pay the price for his selfishness. To make him pay the price to follow God. Because you know what? Darlene Check doesn't know Kevin Baird. And when Darlene Check said to Clayton Baird, you better be there when I say even though he had no car and he lived two and a half miles from the school and he had to walk there to set up the chairs, walk back home, wait for church, walk back, go to church for three hours, tear down the chairs, walk back home in the middle of the night, not have enough money to pay his bills, not have enough food to eat, ate ramen noodles every day of his life. Clayton Baird needed that to grow into the man of God he is because if he would have been an Anderson or USC or Clemson and he could have gotten home to mama and he could have stood in front of me with those little eyes that are so convincing and tell me mommy I need you to give me money I need it mama please <laughs> mama would have done it daddy would have fought me but mama would have done it <laughs> and so he had to go away and he became this awesome thing Clayton was the first child American student to ever stand on the on the stage of Hillsong and back up darling check ever that wasn't because we pampered him it's because we kicked his rear end out of the house and said you go he called one time crying saying I don't have enough money I'm starving I'm sick please send me money I was on the phone crying I said we are eating bologna sandwiches and eating macaroni and cheese to send you there we don't have any money we said, go get a job. And Nancy, it was hard. He had no car. He's like, Mama, how do I get? I said, I don't know. Catch a bus. Do something. I don't know. Go get a job. And he's like, how do I get to church and do all that Miss Check wants me to do and, and do all that? I don't know, Clayton. But you said it was God to go. You said it was God to go now. Get your God moment. He loved that story about macaroni and cheese and how his daddy and I ate it for two weeks when we were first married. Lived off five dollars for two weeks. He loved to hear that story. Now make one of your own. All right? We love them, but we got to send them out there in their giftings, but also knowing their weaknesses. Tyler, different, different story altogether, real quickly. Tyler is always the child that wanted to keep peace at all cost. Teachers loved him, Miss Cindy. He'd be in their third grade class and she, they'd walk out of the room to go to the office for a second. Now y'all be good, everybody stay in your seat. And they'd all be getting up and Todd would be going, no, 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 everybody, everybody sit down, sit down, sit down. We don't want to make Miss, Miss Folsom mad. We don't want to upset her. Everybody sit down, everybody sit down. He would go to people's houses and the mothers would say, I love it when Tyler comes over because my children calm down around him. <laughs> he has this calming effect. That's great, and you think that compliant spirit is a gifting, and it is, but it can also turn into a weakness. Clayton, I mean, Tyler graduated from Northwood Christian School. He was in a class of Christian kids, and they were all great, and they all lived for Jesus because if they caught you not living for Jesus, you got your hiney expelled. So all these kids were thought were these awesome Christian kids living for Jesus. And then a month after his graduation, Tyler's at a party with some kids who he hung around with all through high school. We, didn't, we knew he was there. But then about five of them decided they were gonna get out some wine coolers. They're gonna start drinking. And guess who just happened to come to the house that day when the mom and daddy were gone? The principal. Just happened by the Holy Ghost to show up at that house. We believe it was absolutely the Holy Ghost. We thank God that it was the Holy Ghost. See, you parents who think, oh, ooh, too bad that happened. No, no, you need to thank God your kids get caught. So Tyler Baird got his hiney caught. Now here's the testimony of every child at that party. 
Oh, Mrs. Baird, they called us. Oh, Pastor Baird, pl please no, Tyler didn't do anything. He didn't drink. He kept telling us, don't do this, don't do this. You're going to get in trouble. We're all going to get in trouble. Don't do it, don't do it. But he didn't leave. And they said he didn't leave because he said, when y'all get drunk, I'm going to drive you home and save your life. Sounds good. Eh, wrong answer. We looked at him that day and we said to him, the day they decide they're going to rob a liquor store and you're the ding dong in the car with them, you're going to prison just the same. So that day, even though we had already applied, gone for the tour, signed up for the roommate at Charleston Southern University, plans changed at the Baird house because God showed us that Tyler's compliant spirit was a weakness and that he needed to be sent somewhere where he could grow up and get some spiritual backbone and we sent him to Bethany World Prayer Center the song we were singing this morning during prayer time Pastor Jonathan Stockstill Pastor Joel he sat under them for two years and let me tell you his life was changed now, Kaylin, we're in the midst of figuring out what Kaylin's doing. God's working in her life. She's different. So we've got to figure all that out. But let me tell you this, parents. We have to realize that our, our children have strengths and they have weaknesses. And we have to look at both of them. We can't just say, oh, they'll never mess up. Just sending your kid to a Christian school does not mean you get to check out at the door. You still better be praying for the Holy Ghost to show you. And I won't go into it, but you all know my stories about sitting on the couch downstairs in our house on Jay Island, and the Holy Spirit said, you walk upstairs right now to Clayton's room and you listen at the door. And I did. And I saved him from a life of destruction at that point. Something the enemy had set a snare for him that would have ruined him forever. Same with Tyler with that situation. Thank God he got caught. You know what? You better check your child's texting. That's all I want to say. Don't be idiots and give them a phone and then think, oh, they'll never do anything wrong. They love Jesus. Well, you love Jesus and do you ever do anything wrong? There you go. Okay. Now listen here. Deuteronomy eleven eighteen says, therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You should teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. What does that mean? That means as you're doing life, your children are watching you. They're watching how, how you react, what you say. And here's my deal. We walk around as spirit-filled Christians and we say, train up a child in the way that they should go. We say, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. We say things like, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. We say, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans he has for me, plans to prosper me, not to harm me. We can quote it all off. But here's my question. When God says to your child, that they're called to do something that's outside of your box of comfortability, what are you going to do with it? Some parents, I don't know if they're in this room, but I know they're in my daughter's life, they can't think bigger than the state of South Carolina because their child is going to get the life scholarship. Can I just say every one of my children got this life scholarship and the only one that used it was Clayton and that was a mistake. He should have never been there to start with. You say you trust God. You say you're a parent of faith. But what if God is calling your child like he is ours unless he changes his mind in the next year to a Christian university out of state that costs a whole bunch of money. Do we have a whole bunch of money? No. Do we have a college fund? No. Do we have a God? Yes. Do we trust him? Yes. Will he make a way where there seems to be no way? Yes. It talks great. It lives a little harder. I'm telling you, please don't box God in when it comes to your children. Uh, another couple of other mothers real quick Jochebed mother of Moses 
mother of Moses, you know, Jochebed's not even mentioned in Exodus chapter 2. It talks about her, but it doesn't ever say her name. She's this nameless woman who is probably the best mother of the Bible. And why is that? Because she was willing to give up her son to save his life. Remember? Uh, is it Pharaoh is one of the one of the kings was killing all the baby boys and so she put him in a basket and hid him in the bulrushes now she did get to be his nanny up until the time he was five years old but you know she didn't know that at the time she put him in those bulrushes that he would ever get that she'd ever see him again she didn't know that she did teach him that he was an, uh, an Israelite but you know it doesn't say that she ever told him I am your real mother but she did teach him that he was an Israelite in the ways of God but she was a selfless mother because she wasn't thinking of herself. And on today, this Mother's Day, I want to give special honor to my mother, Evelyn Maccabee. Mama, I know you're watching. My mother was very selfless. When I left for college in 1980, my mother was going through one of the most difficult times of her life. She must have felt like her whole world was falling in on her. But never not even for one moment did my mother beg me or try to convince me to stay and help her. She wanted me to have my dream. She also protected me from all the pain that she was going through. And some of you need to listen to me right now, especially you young girls, college age girls, even young mothers. We think we know our mother's story. Let me tell you right now, I can rest assured to tell you, you do not know your mother's story. You do not know all that she has ever gone through in her life. You do not know the ups and downs and the trials and tribulations she has been through. But you misjudge her because I misjudged my mother. I misjudged her as being a weak woman who couldn't stand up for herself. But in recent years, the Lord has revealed to me that my mother was anything but weak. She was of strong character and Christian values. She walked in the spirit of forgiveness like none I have ever met. Instead of burdening with me with the weight of all the disappointments of her life, which she had many, she exemplified two great virtues, mercy and love. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And instead of vindictively dumping the truck on all the people who had hurt my mother throughout her life, she allowed me to still honor and respect them. And how did she do that? Because she covered their sin. What a blessing my mother has been to me. Now real quickly, Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Bathsheba was a mother who made lots of mistakes. If you know that, say amen. <laughs> Bathsheba became a mother through an adulterous affair with King David. Now however, that baby, it died. But she and David repented. And then God blessed her with another baby boy named Solomon. But when Nathan the prophet came with a name that the Lord had given to Solomon, do you know what the name was? Jedidiah, which means loved of the Lord as a testimony of his continuing grace of God. Solomon became one of the most peaceable leaders in all the world, rulers of all the world. He's actually known as the wisest man in the world. Bathsheba gives hope to women that no matter what the story or the situations were of your pregnancy, of the birth of your child that God can redeem any situation who knows you might be raising one of the wisest people this world will ever know and last but not least we have Mary the mother of Jesus Mary's story starts in Luke 1 uh, for Luke 1 26 we won't be able to read the story but Mary became a mother when she was approximately 14 years old now can you imagine can you imagine the judgments that went out in that town and that day Mary was chosen by God because she loved him so much. An angel came, and in the words of Tracy, he kind of says something like this. Because you are so favored, you get to endure the ridicule of all your neighbors, family, and friends. <laughs> Talk about a mother who was in over her head. She was called to be the mother of God. Can you imagine? Yes, there are expectations on all of us, and there were expectations on Mary to be perfect, you know, she wasn't perfect. Mary was not divine. She was just a young woman who loved God and wanted to be holy. And the good news is, ladies, if our heart is to be holy and to love God, then he's going to help us to be a good mother too. You know, Mary wasn't perfect. When Jesus was 12 years old, she lost him at the temple. 
I mean, she left town and left him. Can you imagine? I mean, I've never done that. I've, I've wanted to do it a couple times, but I didn't do it, okay? But she left Jesus. And then, get this, when she came back, he kind of smarted off to her a little bit, it seemed like, you know? I mean, in Luke chapter 2, I mean, I know Jesus didn't sin, but I mean, come on. I mean, I'm going to read this, see what it says. He said, in the message Bible, he said, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know I'd be here doing the things of my father? And she and Joseph looked at each other and they didn't have a clue what that meant. And don't you think for just one minute that she wanted to say, hey, you don't talk to me like that. I'm your mother. I mean, but what do you say to your son when he's God? I mean, exactly, you know, how do you spank the son of God? I mean, I guess she had to. But remember they had, they got in that little squabble at the wedding of Cana because Mary knew what Jesus was capable of. Now, he wasn't quite ready yet. But I started thinking about that. Maybe Mary was tired of a 33-year cover-up. <laughs> you know, maybe she was ready for somebody to know she didn't just get pregnant by anybody. She got pregnant by the Holy Ghost, and that was time to be vindicted. I mean, to be vindicated. She was ready for somebody to know the truth. But how do you force your son, when he's God, to do what you want him to do? You don't. You just encourage him. So in, the, and so in the words of a Jewish mother, she looked at her, the servants, and she said this. Whatever he says, just do it. <laughs> you know, even Mary may have had a little trouble as a mom, and she kind of wanted to live vicariously through the identity of her son. You know, and we as moms got to be so careful with that, and my time's almost up here. But you know, we gotta be careful that we train up a child in the way sh they should go, not in the way we want them to go. You know, according to what I hear about Jewish mothers, they all want their children to be doctors. You know, <laughs> Jesus wasn't a doctor. What do you want your child to be? But is that God's will? Maybe it even goes a little bit deeper than wanting to prove to your next door neighbor that he's not the goof up kid that they always said he would be. Maybe somebody said that you were a screw up and that you're now trying to prove through your children that you're not a loser. And that losers don't raise these great kids who get all these scholarships and get all these trophies and get all these accolades. And I want to be a part of that. You ever watch Dance Moms? Oh, my heavens. Try not to, okay? Uh, I have to admit, Kaylin and Tyler watch it just to laugh. But um, Dance Moms is a group of women who are trying to get their affirmation from the fact that their girls are in dance competition. And these women act like fools. Have you ever watched toddlers in tiaras? Yes. Okay, that's a bunch of overweight women trying to live vicariously as a pageant queen through their daughters, okay? The wannabe pageant queens. It's very unattractive. And I said all that to say this. Maybe even for a super spiritual, holy young woman like Mary, being a mother wasn't easy. But the word of the Lord says in 1 Samuel that God opens and closes the womb. God looked down on each of us, ladies. He saw, us, he saw all our imperfections. Back when I was 19 years old, Mary and Kevin Baird, he knew there was a lot of stuff I was going to do wrong. But he opened up my womb and let me become a mother to actually four babies because one of them's already in heaven and her name is Mariah. And this morning, this is what I want us to do. Let's just all stand. And Brad, if you'll go ahead and come. You know, when I was reading that commentary about train up a child in the way you should go, it said in there, if you caught it, it was presupposing that we as mothers and dads we're emotionally and spiritually mature enough to do the job. Can I be the first one to say, I have not always been emotionally or spiritually mature enough to do the job, but for some reason God let me do it anyway. This morning, as Brad goes ahead and starts playing, we're going to open up this altar because pastor tells us that we all need an anointing for all things. Do we need an anointing to parent? Some of you are just starting out as parents and some of us are finishing up. 
I need to have an anointing to finish well with this one. Girls are so different than boys, can I just say? I need an anointing. You need an anointing. Some of you are working mothers. Some of you are stay-at-home moms. And can I just say, a stay-at-home mom needs just as much anointing, if not more, than a working mom. Because I'm telling you, you are with those kids 24 hours a day, and some days you just want to hurt them. That obviously isn't God's will, but it's true. Some days you just need a break. But working moms have that guilt that the world puts on them that they're not there enough. So no matter what God's called you to do and where he's called you to be, you need an anointing. I also want us to take this time this morning to break every judgment that we've ever made towards someone else. Judgments about if your kid's not sleeping through the night. Kaylin Bear didn't sleep through the night till she's three and a half. God, help me. But just look at her now. Clayton wasn't potty trained till he was almost four. And he's preaching to thousands. Tyler didn't talk till he was two and a half. Not a word. People thinking, you're just a terrible mother. You don't know what you're doing. You know what? Your children probably didn't fit into the mold like mine didn't fit into the mold because God said, I'm going to blast the mold of this world and I'm going to call them to be something else. Now, the question is, are you emotionally and spiritually mature and ready to help them to do that? So Lord, right now, we just open up these altars. And Lord, that song we sang this morning, here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Lord, tell me the truth about myself. Lord, reveal to me the mistakes that I've made and let me repent of them. Lord, tell me the truth about my child. Lord, take the veil off of my eyes. Lord, help me to see my child for what you've gifted them to be, what you've gifted them to do. Lord, help me to also see their weaknesses and not put a veil over my eyes where I deny that they have any weaknesses. Because, Lord, they do. And my job is to mold and shape and discipline and encourage and correct so that they might be the vessels of God that you can pour yourselves through. So, Lord, this morning, speak to us. Lord, I pray right now that you will break the end of the pencil for some of these parents in this room today whose children are called and are aspiring to bigger things than the state of South Carolina. Lord, there is no scholarship to Hillsong International Leadership College. But Lord, you made a way. You blessed us and everything was paid for when it needed to be. Lord, that is nothing short of a miracle. But first, we had to step out in faith and invest in our child. So Lord, this morning, we give this time to you. Speak to us this, Lord, this morning in Jesus' name.